guys. Uh, I'm Juan, going to do this talk. Uh, before we start, we didn't start yet. <laughs> before we start, I wanted to ask, so uh, I can tailor it a bit better for your needs. Uh, how many of you guys actually like or are enthusiasts or go about like rendering? You guys, if you can raise your hand, how many like rendering? Okay, that's quite a good amount. Oh, okay, how many of you that do rendering actually are interested in, in Vulkan? Okay, that's a good amount. And how many actually understand Vulkan? <laughs> uh, not so many, okay. Okay, then I won't go into that many super <laughs> low level technical details of Vulkan because it can be, uh, we tried this a few months ago and it didn't end very well because uh, uh, Vulkan is like a bit difficult. <laughs> uh, it takes a while. So we still have a bit more time, I guess. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So that's okay. Uh, well, nice to see so many interest, so much interest in rendering. Yes. When it's worried that today you see a lot of game engines and like, including a lot and that people won't be interested in anymore about rendering, but nice to see that you guys actually like it. So, mm, okay, how many here have used Godot? Oh, nice. Good to see so many Godot users. It keeps growing every year. That's nice. Nice to that you're here and not in the global game jam at least. That's <laughs> it's something. So, uh, okay. Well, the talk will be mostly about uh, the kind of things that we take advantage of using Vulkan. I think when Vulkan came out uh, a few years ago, it wasn't very clear uh, what it was for because you had OpenGL, it worked. It, there was DirectX 11 and DirectX. X12 was still kind of like something new and nobody really quite got what it was about. Uh, when we saw Vulkan, we were like, what is this for? So we took a while actually to get the engine to be ported to Vulkan. Uh, it's still in, in the process. Uh, we learned a few bad things about <laughs> OpenGL while porting it to OpenGL 3 and 4, uh, more, more like 3.3. .3. So. We had a lot of problems with the drivers and a lot of driver bugs with OpenGL. Uh, now, for example, we started having bugs that we didn't have before because the GPU makers uh, just abandoned the OpenGL drivers and they started bit rotting, for example. So in the end, we really had to, to go to Vulkan. And when you, for example, we started getting reports from users about performance issues they have, and you would look like, for example, you render a scene with 20,000 objects, it was super slow. Uh, because every object used a different material, like, but uh, not, not even a different material, a different uh, geometry. The material was the same for the 20,000. It was really slow. So I was like, what if we try with the same geometry? Like, they were 20,000, they have different geometry, but just a cube, like, you know, not many vertices. Uh, we tried using the same cube, and then it went super blazing fast. So there's cases in OpenGL drivers, like that you, the driver does like validations on things under the hood and some combinations of circumstance that you don't really know, uh, and they result in slowdowns that are kind of unpredictable. Uh, if you're like using Linux and Mesa, you can kind of see what a driver does. I'm not sure, have any of you actually seen any Mesa code? Uh, well, it's, it's interesting uh, if you want to see how a driver, OpenGL driver works. Uh, they do a lot, of, a lot more under the hood than you may expect that a driver does. So with Vulkan, it's kind of like the the uh, GPU makers, they went like completely to the other side. They said, we're going to make an API that is completely low level. It does no validation for you. You can actually crash your operating system uh, or more like your windowing system using Vulkan because it does no validation. Uh, you can just like, do whatever you want. So they went totally the other side. Um, I got a few lookups of my computer, especially if you if you run Windows, it's kind of uh, crashes on the video restarts. Uh, if you are using uh, X11, it just dies, so you have to just restart it yourself or, or kill it from a terminal. Uh, so you start learning the kind of things that crash, and you're like, why they didn't validate this? It was so easy, but actually, the philosophy was we won't validate anything. Just do whatever you want. You have the full performance, 
uh, we give you the gun loaded, you just do whatever you want. Uh, so it's very interesting, actually. So, well, are we on time to start, church? Yes. Yeah. Two minutes. It's okay. Uh, in two minutes? Yeah. Two oh, minutes. two more minutes. Okay. Then uh, I will tell you a bit more about Vulcan Yes. Um, don't you have validation layers? Yes, you have validation layers. The validation layers are actually really useful. But the problem is that if you do something, the validation layer may spit an error. This is something that took me a while to understand because I used to put the validation layers and the validation layers will throw an error every time something goes out. But validation er doesn't do really anything. It just throws an error but passes your command through anyway. So the problem is that I got a lot of crashes even with the validation layer. I was why isn't it validating it? But yeah, it was printing the error, but then the computer froze. So you, you have to put a breakpoint on the validation layer when it tells you to write an error, and then you, you can survive it by just like catching the error be before it freezes. Now, these kind of things are really cool when you work with, with Vulkan. Uh, you start learning it like uh, just by making those mistakes, I guess. Uh, and then I was getting the actual error from the validation layer, but I didn't know it because it was freezing. So it was like, hey, no error was printed. Like, yeah, you, of course, it doesn't keep scrolling because it's frozen. So <laughs> these kind of things are, it, it's very hardcore. But once you start getting the hang of Vulkan, I think it's beautiful that you get so, so much low level access to decide how to adapt your rendering code the best as possible as your engine. Uh, to your code and your engine. Actually, one thing I, I found is that Godot is a general purpose game engine. And are we okay? Okay, well, I will just conclude this phrase and, and start the presentation. So Godot is a general purpose game engine. And uh, since we need to satisfy the needs of so many games, we need to look for algorithms that are kind of uh, all-rounders, you know? Maybe there's algorithms for, I don't know, for cooling the scene or for doing rendering, shadow mapping, uh, different kinds of materials. There are better for different kind of games. Uh, if you were making your own uh, AAA, super uh, high budget game, you will be fine uh, doing your own stuff. Uh, but when you have a general purpose game engine, you need to find all rounders, you know, algorithms that will work for most of the games. Uh, and maybe add some tweaking options for different kinds of games. But mostly it should be like good performance overall, but not best performance for specific use case. Maybe some users just take the code and optimize it for a specific use case. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Vulkan is really good if you want to like extract the latest, the the, the, the smallest drip of performance uh, out of of the API. If you're making like a custom game made in Vulkan, uh, but for something general purpose, it's a little more complicated. I think they they didn't design it so much for it. Uh, so there was a lot of trickery that needed to be done. But yeah, it's very interesting. So if you're going to learn Vulkan, just just good luck. It's it's very nice. So I will start with a few facts about Godot. <coughs> Little information about the game, the game engine. Uh, Godot is fully open source. We make an MIT li licensed engine. Uh, it only uses uh, compatible third-party license, so we don't mix proprietary or GPL or anything, just MIT compatible license. Uh, and we have it on, hosted on GitHub. Uh, one may think like, why making an open source game engine? Uh, what's, what's the point of doing that? And um, many people don't know that, like, of all the software industry revenue, uh, the whole software industry, like everything that writes code and sells it, the whole software industry revenue, out of all that revenue, 25% comes from the video game industry, you know? But when you hear about open source, you don't really hear about games. You just hear about Python, Apache, uh, MongoDB, uh, like, things that are made productivity, a business, uh, services, so there's kind of a big gap in open source in general for whatever is games, I think. So Godot tries to fit, to fill that 25% missing uh, for the open source software. Uh, so we, we feel our mission is important, even, even if uh, <laughs> it's kind of odd because, you know, in like, in, we go to events like GDC and they're like, ah, open source, go to an open source event. And we come to open source events, ah, games, go to a game event. Like, so we're kind of like in the middle of something. We believe our mission is super important, but we are still in a limbo. So, well, yeah, we are fully open source. Uh, we have a really active developer community. This actually is old. We have over a thousand now contributors, like well over a thousand. This has some months and it's already went from 800 to 1,000. Uh, we have more contrib core contributors. In fact, the Godot 3.2, we just released Godot 3.2 uh, some days ago. 
uh, had like almost 400 contributors. Uh, so there's a lot of people really interested in, in making this engine happen and contributing. Uh, it's, I think, the third or fourth most fastest growing project in GitHub or something like that. Uh, and we have like hundreds of PRs open every month. Uh, so it's quite a growing project. Uh, we have a very active user community. Again, this is all we just released 3.1, so this probably keeps growing. Uh, so yeah, we, we have like a large community on Steam. We publish Godot on Steam. Uh, so we know uh, we have a lot of, uh, we now have like over 900 reviews in our really overwhelmingly positive. Uh, so yeah, if you go to Twitter, if you go to Reddit, if you go to Discord, if you go to IRC, uh, Facebook, uh, you will find really large code communities, really helpful. We try to make sure that the tone is always nice and friendly. Uh, so, well, let, let's go about, uh, let's start, end with the facts, go with Vulkan. So, uh, Godot used to be a proprietary game engine. Uh, Ariel, Mansour, and I had our company for a long time. Uh, at some point, we open source the game engine, like in 2014, and it started growing. Back then, it was mostly meant for mobile. It had 3D rendering, but it wasn't very good. It was just OpenGL 2. When Godot 3 came out, uh, we ported to OpenGL 3.3, so we could use newer features and use OpenGL ES3. With, at the time, it was a few years ago, it was, seemed like a really good idea. Uh, but the truth is that uh, OpenGL on mobile is broken. The drivers are all broken. Uh, mobile devices don't get updated, so it's uh, it was a pain. Uh, and then, yeah, we saw that OpenGL, when Vulkan came out, they said, yeah, this is going to be an alternative. We're going to continue working on OpenGL. Lies. It's abandoned. Nobody cares anymore about OpenGL. It's dead. So. Uh, one thing about OpenGL is that the API design is, does not really map very well to modern hardware. Uh, it's not really, when you learn Vulkan, you realize what the hardware actually does. And you understand that OpenGL doesn't really, like, I will give you a, a very small example since so many of you actually are interested in rendering. You know, in OpenGL, you can, like, set the vertex buffer, you can set uh, the textures in use, you can set uh, a lot of, uh, rastering operations like the winding of the triangles or if you draw lines or if you write uh, quads or what, quads in not anymore, uh, triangles, lines, points. Uh, you, you can change a lot of things and then you call the draw function. When Did you know that when you do all these things, changing the state, OpenGL actually is patching the shader. Uh, actually, it's modifying the code of the shader. It has a shader in memory that you bind the shader. You change all these things, then it binds the shader. Uh, if you change like the shader, it needs to re- Patch the shader with all the changes you have done. Uh, so there's a lot of code, invisible code inside of, of OpenGL that you don't know that is patching the shader and doing a lot of work every time you change those status. The APIs are like Vulkan, which are called, uh, it's not entirely stateless, but it's mostly pipeline based. It's called pipeline based. You just create like one object with all the states, uh, and if you want to change the state, you just create more of those objects, you know? If you want, uh, if it, the pipeline has like the shader, and all the states you set in OpenGL, like the vertex buffer format, and the, the geometry, and the anti-aliasing, everything, just in one object. So the thing is, when you set a pipeline to draw, it just sets everything at once, and it's super, super fast. This, this is really fast. So Vulkan forces you to be uh, to just get your 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 data together properly, and when you set everything together, it's just just much faster. So these kind of things make it much more optimal to draw a large amount of objects. When we started porting the engine to Vulkan, the first thing we noticed was a huge increment in performance, even in the 2D engine, because we just call GL draw arrays like every time we draw a, a primitive. Uh, and just using Vulkan, even if you're doing the same amount, like not the same, but similar amount of cost, the performance was like, whoa, it was impressive how much it, it, uh... so on. Uh, Vulkan is more modern than OpenGL. Uh, it's more up to, more up to date. For example, if you want to use ray tracing extensions, now, uh, uh, there's going to be, uh, it's only NVIDIA, but soon there's going to be like an official RTX implementation for Vulkan. So this is not any longer in OpenGL because, as I said, OpenGL is dead. Uh, so the, all the new extensions like HDR rendering, a lot, lot of new things are just coming out for Vulkan. OpenGL is just ignored nowadays. Uh, it kind of, this sounds a bit weird, weird but it really works as an entry barrier uh, because we have the problem that, for example, 
all the rendering, we we thought that we were going to making OpenGL 3.3 compatible, which dates back to DirectX 10, like 2008, 2009, I think, I think around that. So you can run all the high-end Godot 3 renders and shaders in really old hardware. And truth is that that doesn't work in that hardware because the hardware has too little video memory, too, too little limitations, it's low. So with Vulkan, we can just make sure that if you have old hardware, you're not going to, to ruin it because it's just designed for modern stuff. And we don't have users complaining, ah, Godot this low, because yes, you run it in 10 years old hardware and you're putting all the pretty effects on, of course it's going to be slow. So now it's a nice entry barrier, which means that we can focus on like optimizations and new features and everything, and people that use Vulkan will be able to run it. And if you have a computer that does not support Vulkan, you're going to be using the OpenGL renderer, which is the compatibility render, uh, which, which is designed for hardware, so you will be fine anyway. I mean, less confusion for the users is good for us. Uh, one of the new things we added to Godot is creating a new, a new layer, which is rendering device. Uh, now, this is very interesting. Uh, the rendering APS, actually, even if Vulkan looks really, really complicated, because it is, you can actually abstract uh, to a higher level API really easily and make something really simple because now you only have like pretty much the textures, the buffers, uh, the the frame buffers, and even some APIs like Metal don't even have that. Uh, you have the the shaders, the pipelines, and then the the, the render list, and that's it. There's not so much. Uh, actually, amazingly. Uh, even if in some aspects Vulkan is really complicated, uh, a lot of complexity that came from the time of OpenGL has been lifted because now a lot of things are more general purpose than they used to be. So in Godot 4, we are going to have the visual server, which is the, the main abstraction for rendering. It's, it's the, the entry barrier for anything that has to do with, with rendering. And we're going to have two rasterizers. One is going to use RDS rendering device, and rendering device is what abstracts Vulkan. Uh, we can make it a track now Metal or DirectX 12, or there's some people porting it to PlayStation. We can't do it because we are open source, but they can use to port. It's much easier to port a uh, rendering device to Vulkan. And then we have a rasterizer that is GLES2. Uh, um, maybe we, we will add some GLES3 uh, functionality. Uh, and this just uses OpenGLES. So we have a completely different, I mean, Visual Server abstracts the API, but then you're going to have a different, completely different backend depending on modern stuff or compatibility stuff. So it, this is transparent to user. You just switch uh, if you want to use OpenGL or Vulkan and everything just works. Uh, whatever is done support in OpenGL doesn't appear. Uh, it's just hidden. So so well, the other thing that users requested a lot in Godot that you couldn't do before, that you will be able to do in Godot 4, is that you will be able to access from your scripting language or whatever you want, like C++, to rendering device, which is the, the Vulkan abstract, like the rendering abstraction. So if you actually want to do like more advanced custom rendering on the engine, now you, you, you will be able to because you will be able to insert your own code uh, during the rendering loop. Uh, that hopefully will be very nice. Uh, it was one of the most requested features. Uh, and yeah, it's eventually portable to more APIs. Uh, there's like porting, if you wanted to port Godot 3 to the PlayStation, you have to write the entire rasterizer, which is really huge. Uh, for Godot 4, you just port like rendering device and that's it. It's much, much smaller. So, another thing we're going to have in Godot 4, we, we decided it was the best uh, way to go is, at first, uh, we tried to do our rendering, uh, Vulkan rendering code that supports both uh, mobile and, and desktop. But as, as we started working on this, we realized that mobile and desktop are really completely different architectures. It's not even worth trying to use the same code for both. So Godot is going to have a high and low end Vulkan renderers. This is separate from the OpenGL legacy renderer. So the high end will be just for, for, for desktop. We are just going to use like, for example, let me give you a few examples like on desktop, Vulkan has something called uh, descriptor sets, which is the amount of uh, uh, like you could call it uniforms uh, and other things that you combine to a shaders in groups. Uh, like on desktop, it's like I think the limit is 16, but on mobile it's four. So you, you, when you have more, you can optimize more a lot of things. Uh, so we were being restricted to four just for mobile. Then at some point, it's not, it's not worth it. Let's just make the high end use this. Uh, for example, uh, on desktop you can have something called. Uh, 
indirect texture in uh, indirect texture addressing. You can put all your textures in a big array, and then you use an integer to address the textures. Uh, this works fine on desktop. It has very little cost. On, mo on mobile, you just can't do it. Uh, so, and for example, on mobile, you still have really low texture limits. Like I think you can. Some architectures like ARM, Mali drivers, don't let you have more than 16 textures in total or samplers. Uh, actually, I, not even samplers, just textures. You, you can't have more than 16 textures uh, per shader. Uh, while on desktop, this is infinite. You can have all the textures you want. Maybe the samplers are limited because it's a hardware limitation, but the texture you can have as many as you want. So the problem is that the difference between what you can do on mobile and what you can do on desktop right now is so big, it's so, so big, it doesn't really really make sense to make something that works for both. You know, you're, you're going to be crippling the desktop uh, just to make mobile work. So you're, we're going to have high and low render. Remember, I think for Vulkan, it the, makes the most sense. Also, uh, for mobile, there's something you can do, which call, it's a Vulkan feature, which is called subpasses. Have you heard of subpasses? Well, well subpasses are uh, something you can use on mobile due to how mobile chipset works. Like, mobile have a lot of, uh, when, when you have something render, when you render on, on desktop, uh, it's just brute force, pretty much. It just draws all the triangles to throw one after the other. On mobile, the screen is divided like in tiles, in cells, and every cell has a list of the triangles that, th that touch this cell when you render. And then at the end, it rasters all the triangles. They do it this way, so they can uh, have like more parallelism, and actually, it's like even if you render forward, it's always deferred, because it only shades the last pixel that was drawn after. It's like a mini deferred render in a tile. So because they work like that, maybe you want to have many passes. Like, for example, you do a different renderer, and then the first pass, you want to render all the materials, and the second pass, you want to do the shading. So if you have sub-passes, you're telling the, the mobile uh, driver that after the, this pass, I'm going to do shading. So if a tile is done doing the, the rendering of the triangles, it can go to the next pass uh, while the other tiles didn't finish. So it's so different. Uh, Mobile and desktop are really different. So you should probably, if you're going to use Vulkan, Vulkan it gives you so, such low level access to these kind of things that it's a waste to try to make something that works on both. Just make one that works for mobile, just one make one that works for, for desktop. That's what we ended up doing with Godot. So the idea is that they are still both compatible and you will be able to switch between the high and low end renderers at, at any time. Um, well, as I was saying before, Vulkan is designed for, uh, I explained to you this before, it's just designed for low uh, bottlenecks, like low amount of bottlenecks, just very low driver overhead. You just can, it's, it's amazing, you just do a lot of calls, draw calls, you can have like, I don't know, 50,000 draw calls in Vulkan, and it uses so little CPU compared to OpenShield that it's, it's, it's amazing. So the first thing, as I was telling before, that we saw, uh, when moving from OpenGL to Vulkan was the, a massive improvement of performance uh, when just drawing a large amount of objects, 2D or, or 3D, it's it just a massive improvement. Uh, one thing that people may get confused is that, yes, Vulkan is faster, but calling the API is mostly faster. Like, if you have a very simple scene, like uh, just one room with a few things that are furniture and really complex shaders, it's going to run the same in OpenGL and in Vulkan. Because the shader performance is the same in both, it is, that doesn't change. But if you have a really huge like scenario, like a city or I don't know, uh, under un, un, underwater or something really big that you can see really far away, yeah, Vulkan will make a big difference there. Like for really large stuff or something that has a lot of small objects, that's going to make just a huge difference. So. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the same. Uh, for 2D, it improved, the, the performance improved huge, hugely. Uh, it's impressive how, how fast it is. Like, for 2D, it's very difficult. Like When you work on 2D on OpenGL, you usually want to implement like things like batching because uh, there's a lot of... Uh, you just put everything in an array and then send it to render uh, because uh, the cost of the draw call in itself is kind of slow in, in mobile, especially in mobile. Uh, but with Vulkan, it's like, since there's no validation between the draw calls or anything, you, you can just throw the, the commands, and it doesn't seem to really have any uh, performant impact. That, that's really impressive, how, how well the drivers are optimized for a very high amount. And if you want to even optimize it better, 
what you can do is simply like run like the, the render list. You can separate it. Uh, you have the you, imagine you want to render twenty thousand objects. You can run threads that each like you want to run eight threads. Each each one renders a chunk of the objects uh, in a separate part of the list, and then you put them together and so on. This kind of optimization is great. So. This is really important. It, it, it's, it's a very big advantage of Pulkan, but uh, it's very often overlooked. Uh, is that OpenGL is very buggy because it's very complex. If you look at an OpenGL driver, it's huge. It's really, really big. Uh, you can even, if you look in Google, you can read horror stories about people working at NVIDIA or AMD working on drivers. Like, for example, they were saying, I think at the time uh, OpenGL 4 came out, I think I, I remember reading that, reading that AMD uh, decided to rewrite their OpenGL driver. Um, they started, because the old one was too slow, and they started, uh, they first re rewrote it and it was very fast, uh, but it was very incompatible, it didn't work with a lot of games. So they had to start adding patches to make it work better with different games. By the time they, they ended up adding all the patches to make it work like the old driver, it was slower than the old driver. <laughs> because, and this is AMD, I mean, this is the, the, the top company that makes these kind of things. So OpenGL is very complex. Uh, it's very difficult to optimize because you need to like op you need to optimize the way you think games are going to use it, but then games may use it a different way. Uh, it's ty typical software design problem. Uh, if you try to make something super flexible, uh, you're going to un end with something complicated, and then it's not going to be useful because user users don't really want to use it that way. They still want to use it a different. So with Vulkan, they were like. We suck. We can't make this kind of complex APIs. We just, just let's make something really low level and let the users do whatever they want. Uh, and because of that, the APIs are so simple; they map so directly to the hardware that they are very less prone to have bugs because it's just much smaller. If you look at a Vulkan driver like the Mesa drivers, it's just much smaller. It just maps much more directly to the hardware. Uh, this is very, they're very interesting. I think this was a really good decision at first. When you start learning Vulkan, you're like, what? This is so complicated. Why they made it so complicated? But in the end, you realize that uh, what you write is going to be a lot more effort. That is going to work much better, and it's going to be like less buggy when you run it on different hardware. Uh, which isn't to say that uh, you just if you, if you have NVIDIA or AMD, uh, for example, you still need to try everywhere. Because there are things like barriers, for example. Vulkan has something called barriers. Uh, which you use to uh, synchronization points between different kinds of uh, of tasks, like for example, compute. Uh, you, do, you, co you do compute, and then you want to use what you did for compute for rendering and use it as a texture. You need a barrier, uh, both for for w waiting until the compute is done and for converting the resulting image to something readable uh, by what is rendering. You need this kind of barriers, uh, which you need to put everywhere in in Vulkan, and. Vulkan barriers are really complex. They have a lot of options, and not all, not all the hardware implements all the barriers. You know, I think Nvidia implements them like more coarse. Uh, AMD is more fine grained. So, and, and Intel, uh, <laughs> Intel just like doesn't care about anything. I, I think it's like my, my experiments with Intel is whatever you do, even if you forget all the barriers, still works. So <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> so Intel is just weird, but. Uh, but the thing is, uh, because of this, I had problems like getting, you get something to work, like even in the same AMD drivers, I got things to work in, in AMD in uh, in Mesa, but didn't work in the official uh, AMD driver for Linux, and then you can swap it, and then it works in one and doesn't work. Then you go to NVIDIA and just doesn't work. Uh, on Intel, it always works. It's amazing, because it's, 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 it's just surprising. I don't think they even super barriers in Intel, but, but well. <clears throat> That's what he was saying. Less complexity is uh, less points of failure. You still have to test in all the hardware, but less prone to bugs. Uh, one problem we have with OpenGL is that OpenGL doesn't have a standard way of uh, catching the shaders. So our users often complain that an, an object appears on, on screen that was never rendered. And even if you pre-compile the shader before, it still has like a... <clears throat> It still has like a delay because the driver waits until everything is ready to, to, to render to just actually compile the shader. So there, with OpenGL, we have a lot of stalls all the time. So users have to resort to doing half like making 
like a loading screen that be, that actually is a plane that has all the objects that, that need to be rendered, you know, with all the materials, but you don't see them, they are behind a wall. So the actually forces it to actually compile all the materials before uh, you go into the game. This is very, very typical with OpenGL. Uh, with Vulkan, what they added was is, is something called SpearV. Uh, SpearV is like a shader bytecode. Uh, you compile uh, GLSL. You can actually compile HLSL, which is very popular because it's the Microsoft one. Uh, people that do rendering prefer DirectX. I don't. But uh, HLSL is very popular. I, I, th I don't like it, honestly. I think this, oh, GLSL is nicer, but well, anyway. Uh, you can compile to SpearV from either of the languages uh, on, on Vulkan. And the interesting thing is that SpearV is not really a shader bytecode that, ex that gets executed by the, by the GPU. It's more like a, a middle, you know, if you have seen compi compiler theory, it's like the, it's like the SSA form of the, of the shader. It's kind of pre-optimized up to a point, but it's still not a bytecode. I mean, it's not something you can put on a virtual machine and on a GPU and run it, more like it. So the interesting thing is that it is faster to go from Spear V to the, to the actual uh, GPU bytecode that going from GLSL. It has also the problem with OpenGL, for example, one problem we have is that if you have to list all the GLSL compilers, you have, for example, the, the AMD one, the NVIDIA one, the Intel one, the web browser one because of uh, WebGL. You have the mobile ones, like, for example, the Mali one, the Qualcomm one, the Tegra one, the Apple one, because Apple now no longer uses PowerVR. They, they make their own GPU. So now we have the Apple compiler for GLSL. So there's like 10 compilers for GLSL. Uh, and so one of them is always going to break because parsing text is, is much more difficult than... In theory, it isn't, but in practice, it is. Uh, parsing text is more error prone than parsing just a bytecode that has very specific instructions. So SpearV has the advantage that once it compiles to SpearV, you know it's going to work. Uh, and it's faster to compile from SpearV to, uh, to actually the bytecode. The thing is the following. Uh, the only thing you can actually um, send from one, from imagine you want to distribute your game. You can distribute SpearV shaders, but you can't distribute pipeline objects. You can actually get the binary of the pipeline object because the pipeline object, I mean, you have shader code, you compile it, you get SpearV. SpearV, you combine uh, with all the um, rasterizer data, like which kind of triangles, which kind of frame buffer, which vertex format, everything. All this, you get the pipeline uh, state object. Uh, the pipeline is platform dependent. It's even driver dependent. You, can comp you can't even, like, if you make a game and distribute it for AMD, they may change the driver and it's not going to work anymore. So... You, you need to, you can use to cache it uh, locally, uh, the pipeline on your computer. You have to cache it even saving the driver version. Uh, there's a few articles about that. This are <laughs> pretty interesting because it's very easy to break something caching a pipeline state. But uh, the thing is that even that compiling Spirit to pipeline state is really fast compared to just all the whole uh, thing. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't want to go sidetrack too much, but uh, there's WebGPU coming. You probably heard of WebGPU. There's a big discussion now. You have, we have Apple on one side. Uh, you have Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla on the other side because Apple wants to use something called WHLSL, which is a text format, and all the others want to use a Spear V for WebGPU. And it's been years, and they haven't agreed. Apple really wants, doesn't want to have anything to do with Kronos. They are even deprecated of GL. They are like, say, away Kronos. Uh, and all the other people are, no, SpearV is amazing. Why not use SpearV? We have a lot of tooling for SpearV, which is amazing. We can convert it within a lot of different uh, languages. So they are completely uh, in, in the completely, they, I don't think they will ever agree. So we'll probably see WebGPU for, <laughs> with SpearV for these browsers and with WHLSL for Safari. Uh, that's probably what's going to end up happening at this point because Apple just doesn't want to concede anything. So, um, I actually went into arguments with people from Apple because they really defend the stance on WHLSL. Uh, and my experience is with Godot on WebGPU, but um, you on WebGL, compiling a GLSL shader, it takes a long, long time for Web because it's so many validations for security. So just using bytecode, it's probably still dangerous, but it's faster. So, so that's the... Well, another interesting thing about 
uh, Vulcan is threats. Uh, when you hear about threats and Vulcan, the only thing that probably comes to mind is what you heard about uh, the, the, the secondary command buffers. Uh, you probably, if you are going to read about Vulcan, ah, you can use secondary command buffers. You create each one in a thread and then you put all of them together and then send it to the rendering is faster. Yeah, it is faster. But there's many things that are really cool that you can do with Vulkan. Like, the first is that since it takes PureV and not GLSL, uh, and even if it takes PureV on whatever you want, you can just compile shaders on threads and then you feed the PureV. Uh, it's super, super efficient. Uh, you can actually create many multiple render lists, not just one with multiple secondary command buffers. You can create multiple render lists at the same time, which is also amazing. Like, imagine you're rendering, like, shadow mapping, uh, I need to render like a uh, directional light shadow mapping. You need like the four splits that are typical to this. You can like just create one render list for each at the same time, like as an example. Uh, you can do a lot of really amazing uh, optimizations in, in, in Vulkan with that. The other thing that is really amazing is all the, all the queues with asynchronous texture and buffer transfers. When you start learning Vulkan, the, one of the first things you see, the first is Vulkan device, and then you see the Vulkan queues. Uh, the Vulkan queues are really interesting. It's like, by definition, one of them has to be rendering, compute, and transfer, and then it has to have one transfer one and one compute one, I think. I think it was something like that. Uh, the interesting thing is that, for example, imagine you're running the game, but you want to load a texture uh, asynchronously. What you do is you just use the transfer queue for that. Uh, you just allocate the texture because texture allocation is completely independent of what you are doing. So you just allocate the memory for a texture, and then you use the transfer queue to send the texture while you're still doing your normal rendering in another thread. So that's super, super efficient. Uh, I really like that. Uh, and you can do the same with buffers. If you want to upload geometry, textures, everything, you use the, the, the transfer queues for this. Or even if you want to do things on a thread for compute, you can run compute at the same time. as. So all these kind of things are really, really nice. I actually really enjoy the way it works. It's super complicated, but once you understand exactly what it is, it's, it's really enjoyable. And you can make a lot of really nice optimizations. So, another interesting thing about this is, uh, when you learn, if you come from DirectX 12, like, uh, or DirectX and you go to Vulkan, it, it's going to appear really complicated because Vulkan forces you a lot of things that are normally not necessary for desktop because these things are actually more optimal on mobile. Uh, the secondary, what well, I already talked to you about, talked to you about the, the, um, the render passes, you can just break the rendering render passes so the tiles in the mobile GPU can do work in parallel, even in separate passes. Otherwise, it has to finish and then go to the next one. Now, this is more optimal. The image barriers are interesting. Like, for example, uh, you can use something as a, as a render buffer, and then you want to use it as a, te as a texture, and you want to do a lot of work like that. Uh, since you have to specify all the conversions between what you're using the image for, you can actually make a lot of interesting optimizations. Uh, so yeah, it, it's interesting because it, it kind of sucks if you're going for only desktop, but if you want to optimize for mobile, there's a lot of opportunities there that are really interesting. So the, the last thing is that since we use OpenGL, we didn't have compute. There was OpenCL, but it was never well supported because NVIDIA kind of uh, sabotaged it. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, how you call it, like uh, a lot of uh, internal uh, politics in rendering. It's amazing. Uh, so NVIDIA sabotaged OpenCL. So what they ended up doing it, uh, and yeah, Apple proposed it and then abandoned it. it it's, it's also so weird. So the interesting thing about compute is in Vulkan is that you just use it with GLSL. Uh, it may seem a bit weird because people use compute just see OpenCL or see uh, CUDA, but GLSL is pretty nice for compute. I mean, you can still do things normally and, and it's pretty like to the point, you know? Uh, and a lot of optimizations can be done. Like for example, normally in OpenGL, you, if you want to do a full screen effect, you draw like a quad. Or some people even draw a triangle, so it doesn't render the middle like the middle line, which supposedly it's faster. Uh, so well, there's a lot of things, but in compute you just don't you just run the compute directly. You don't have to go through the through the um, drawing the geometry. It just does compute, so it's it's super interesting. And we are actually exposing uh, compute to the user because if you see a lot of games, it's very interesting. Compute now is so complex that you can use it for gameplay. Uh, you can like, if you want to make a game that has like 10,000 enemies, 
Uh, you can write, totally destroy your CPU trying to do this, or you just can use compute, and compute works fantastic. Uh, and the interesting thing is that in Vulkan, you can have more than one device. Vulkan has a BK device. You can have more than one BK device. So you can just have your device for rendering, and you can have your device for uh, doing game logic, uh, which is really interesting, especially on desktop. Uh, but you can do really complex game logic, like... Internally, it's going to still like try send one thing at a time, supposedly. Uh, I don't really know the implementation details, but you can still do it and it, it works really well. You can optimize your games a lot with, with compute now. Uh, I think this is not something that is used much on game development, but I see in compute a huge opportunity to, to optimize uh, lots of types of gameplay. So, and this is just a few Godot related things because the talk is about Godot. Uh, one thing that we are doing in the new rendering a lot uh, is that this is a kind of usability thing. You're making an engine uh, for people to use. So you give them an option to, you give them a, in an effect, you give them an option. You want to look ugly or pretty, like quality, low and high. And user will always put high because like it looks better, like why not? And then they go like, wow, this is really slow, this engine sucks. So. <laughs> We learned that mistake, so what we're doing now is moving all everything related to uh, the quality and performance. We move to the general settings of the engine, and we put it like, this is low, this is fast. Uh, hoping that this will be uh, a bit more um, obvious for the user that you're like making these mistakes. And also, this is more like a way that Godot works. In Godot, when you have project settings, you can have overrides. Like, for example, if it's going to run on mobile, you can override the setting for mobile. And having the quality settings on the on the project settings allows, for example, if you want, this is the depth of field setting. You know, uh, box is super fast, but looks like a box is kind of a weird uh, depth of field effect. Uh, but it's super fast. If you use it for something small, it's okay. Uh, and cir circle, it's super slow, but looks amazing. It's only for like ultimate uh, dedicated GPUs. So what you can do is you can put an override uh, depth of field shape. Uh, if you are targeting mobile, you can overwrite this uh, and go from circle to uh, box. And you can have, for example, overwrite for low end and high end renderers. And the high end can use circle, the low end can use hexagon, for example. So this is pretty cool, uh, the new things we are doing. And lastly, this is the last item. Um, one thing that uh, we went from OpenGL to Vulkan, but we never have direct text rendering. So we always kept all the like the interpolation, the mid maps, and everything in the texture, which is what happens in OpenGL in Godot 3. But now, uh, textures and samples are separate, and it's really cool because you ca if you separate them, you ha you can have as many textures as you want, just using the samples. But now users will have to move the this, like for example, now we have this in each node for 2D. You have to configure if you want which kind of filtering you want. And if you make materials, you have to configure the filtering on the material, no longer in the texture. That's the last change uh, we have to do. This, again, improves performance and makes sure you have unlimited textures, but the way you work on it is just a bit different. That, that's all. So, well, this concludes the talk. Uh, if you have any questions or want to know more, more, uh, sorry, know more about Godot or Vulkan or anything, I'm here to answer questions. Uh, uh, you were first, sorry. Since you mentioned GPU, what are your plans for it? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, it would be interesting to make a rendering device for WebGPU because it's, it's very interesting. I don't think there is any Vulkan uh, over WebGPU. Uh, could, could be easier to at least test it if we had a Vulkan wrapper for WebGPU. Uh, but we're probably going to have to write a backend for it. That would hopefully will be very interesting. Uh, I don't see that it's going to be this dispute between uh, Apple and the rest of the world. Doesn't seem like it's going to be solved. So uh, I can imagine that the Spear V tools guys are going to make something to convert Spear V back to a text shader so it runs on Apple. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of uh, <laughs> what I think about it. I guess it's uh, it's going to work eventually. Uh, it's going to be a bit messy on Safari probably, but. Yeah, they did to implement it eventually. Uh, probably for Godot 4.1, not for Godot 4, which more or less is stable now. But yeah, that's it. <coughs> and you wanted to ask something? Yeah. Uh, is there any reason for Apple to want their WM? I have no clue. Uh, ah, yeah, sorry. 
he asked is, if there is any reason for Apple to uh, deny, I really don't know what's going on. It's internal politics within the companies. Uh, for us, people outside, doesn't make any sense. Uh, I think Apple exited Kronos at some point because Vul Apple was part of the Vulcan Working Group at to some point, and then they exited Kronos, and they have nothing to do with Kronos anymore. Uh, maybe that has anything to it, but but what GPU is actually W3C is not uh, Kronos, but SPV is Kronos. So maybe because they don't want to have anything with Kronos, I really don't know. It's just speculation. I don't know what. That's that's. Uh, also, um, um, does uh, iOS support Vulkan? Oh. And if so, it has. Uh, no, iOS and Mac OS don't support Vulkan, they support Metal. The thing is that uh, it's not really a secret if you dig into it, but Apple knows that nobody really cares about Metal because the, the, the gamers don't really use Mac. So what they did recently is just add more features to Metal, so the Molten MBK, which is the wrapper that wraps Vulkan over Metal, just works better. Uh, they secretly did it, let's say. Uh, it, it, Apple is uh, you know, it's a very secrecy company. You won't see them at any event. They don't have the public engineers. Uh, it's, it's like a so. In the end, it works really well. We may eventually port uh, rendering device to metal if we see that there is a benefit and an improvement in performance. Because why not otherwise? But in the meantime, right now, it's working with Molten BK. It works really well. Uh, I run it on macOS and it just works. So it's okay. Any other question? Oh, well, let's go right to left. Sorry, you started. Okay. Um, when you talked uh, in the beginning, not about rendering, but about Godot, um, you mentioned how the development is going and everything, but how about users, games using your engine, how, how does the community look from this direction? And also, because like now we're talking about devices, Mac, iOS, everything, do you know where Godot is used more? Uh, that's kind of complicated. Well, if it's a, the question is more about the community, uh, if I understand uh, what they use it more and what they are expecting. Uh, the biggest complaint, the problem is Godot started as a 2D engine mostly. It has 3D, but almost nobody used it. So nobody even bothered to use it and report bugs. When we rewrote it in OpenGL 3.3, more people started to use it, and they had a lot of complaining that it was low, that they needed features, and a lot of things. Uh, so. At the same time, we realized we weren't going to continue working OpenGL because it just didn't work uh, in, in a lot of levels. As I, uh, so we had to set the render in stone for two years, uh, fix a lot of the bugs because 3.0 was a very big release. And now we are porting everything to Vulkan and trying to satisfy all the demands from users about like, improved performance, more features, more modern features, uh, more portability, working on more platforms. So right now, uh, the direction is trying to cope with all the user demand. Uh, it's like the engine is slowly going from a mostly to the engine to a 3D engine too, but yeah, it takes a while until everything. Uh, I think the Vulkan 1 is going to be really cool. I mean, it's going to be almost on the same level as using like the high end render in Unity or Unreal. So it's going to be more or less in that same level, I hope. Uh, or at least it will be close enough that everything else that is missing can be added without that much effort. So yeah, that, that's the situation. Uh, wait, we weren't we're going there. Yes. So um, the Vulkan branch is now merging to Macro. Does that mean that uh, next week's probably, or end of this week probably? Yeah. Okay. Does, does that mean that uh, it is fully integrated? Uh, do they want to download the Vulkan branch? Oh no, not not close. Uh, it's going to be broken for for a while in Master. I mean, it's going to. You shouldn't port your game to Vulkan yet. Uh, some people, some really. Uh, some people that love living on the edge are actually publishing their game on the Vulkan branch. But uh, you should probably not do it. Uh, probably by the middle of the year, the Vulkan branch will be complete, uh, like May, June, or July. And then we will focus on stabilization. So re release will probably be of Godot 4 second uh, half of the year. It will be very usable probably by the middle of the year. You already will be able to use it fine. It's just going to have bugs. Uh, just for developing, it's okay. For releasing, maybe not so much. And when we can actually release, will be a few months later. So that's kind of the roadmap. But yeah, it's, it's going to be totally broken in a week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, you. Are... Uh, is it going to be possible to port games from 3.2 to 4? 
Uh, yeah, uh, porting go games from Godot 3.2 to 4 should be much easier than it was going from 2 to 3, which completely broke a lot of things. Uh, most of the most of the data is remains compatible. You should be able to port your project. Maybe the scripts. The, the, the biggest change may probably be that you have to adjust the texture options in the material now the, because they will be gone from the texture. And the fact that GD script is going to suffer compatibility breaking changes, we will not be so terrible and will be really good. Uh, he's doing them, not me. Uh, and, uh, but it will be really, really much, much better. Uh, we actually may make a script. Uh, we can just parse the old ones and convert to new ones probably. So probably an export tool will, will be needed, but uh, compared to the pain that she knows. Is <laughs> porting a, your game from two to three? This will be a lot less, uh, a lot less uh, painful. So yeah, that, that's it. Uh, we have time for more questions, or we? Are? Yeah. Okay. So go to four. What is what is it gonna use on desktop Windows platforms that don't support Vulkan? Uh, do Windows desktop platform exist that don't support Vulkan? Oh, you mean the older, the older computers that have a GPU that don't run Vulkan? Yes. Uh, no, no, that's going to keep using OpenGL. Uh, the thing is that those are all and have. I mean, what limits you in those platforms is not so much uh, the feature set, but the resources and the performance. Like, if you make a game uh, with Vulkan in mind. You're thinking of the, the GPUs that have maybe four gigabytes of video memory, uh, are really fast. Uh, the older devices that don't support Vulkan, which is kind of like the DirectX 10 level devices, uh, they usually only have like 200 me megabytes of video memory, and they are usually like just lower. Uh, they don't have usually as much, for, maybe a high end one has a bit more, but in average they are not like, they are not as powerful, and they will still not be able to run the game. So. If you want to make a, for 2D games, it's fine because they will look the same in, in it's, it's just going to work. I mean, it's not going to have a lot of difference. Uh, but for 3D games, if we, if you want to make something that uses all the highest end rendering features, uh, on, on those computers, it's just not going to work. Uh, they, I mean, it's going to work, but it's going to be slower. So you should probably use something like instead of, uh, voxelcon tracing for global illumination, you may want to use uh, like mapping, which is faster uh, if you want to run on that device. But yeah, that's that's kind of the the goal. So we have more time. Yeah. Any other questions? So yes. Um, about uh, the rendering, uh, the rendering backends. Um, I don't know if Godot has a PBR pipeline. Yeah, it, it is PBR. Um, well, uh, if you want to implement some new rendering techniques, do you have to implement to implement it for each backend, say for the low end uh, renderer and the high end renderer for Vulkan? Uh, no, that should be the same. It should work. Uh, but that's also, one thing we discussed a lot, which may be interesting for you if you are into rendering, uh, is that Godot is meant to be an easy to use game engine. So, one thing we are not implementing, as an example, is uh, temporal anti aliasing, because it means you need to let users that make shaders understand that they need to get a hold of motion vectors and it's super difficult. I mean, it's already difficult for really big games that, are, that have a lot of budget, so expecting our users to, to be able to maintain motion vectors is probably not worth it. So what you're going to do is find alternate ways to do the same. Like, for example, the high end rendering Godot is going to use uh, forward rendering with cluster lighting, which is kind of uh, trendy now. It's, it's like, I think, what most new games use now. Like, the new Doom, for example, uses that, and I think many new games are moving to that. Uh, so maybe the, then you have the problem that some things have more aliasing that are not just the, the geometry. Uh, so we are, like, using other techniques to, like, reduce that aliasing and still have a very stable image, as an example. The lower end rendering uh, may use a different techniques, maybe just forward single pass or soft, or maybe on the older uh, devices will be uh, forward but multi multi pass, uh, which is better for really old stuff. Uh, but the shader you write, Godot gives you like a GLSL uh, to write your your code, but it's not the GLSL from OpenGL. It's like a managed GSL uh, that is very easy to use, has auto completion, has a lot of outputs already assigned for you to write. Uh, so you write that code, and then that gets compiled for the high end, for the medium end, for the low end, and you don't have to do anything. And if you want to implement like custom lightning, you can like write 
light shaders, uh, and you have, for example, you have the vertex shader, the fragment shader, and the light shader, if you want the code that runs for each light. Uh, so if you want to read something custom, you do that, and then that's going to be compiled as different. The different rendering technique will still run your, your shader in different ways, and you just write it once, and it works. Well, any more questions, or are we okay? Are yes. you running validation free now? Or running? Vulcan validation. Do you have any the Vulcan validation layers? Ah, yes, yes. Well, to yeah. debug, it's always, uh, we always run Vulcan validation. So, I mean, do you see errors in your work of the port? Uh, I think there's nothing now. Uh, but uh, who knows? I mean, <laughs> I, I usually develop on NVIDIA uh, and test on AMD and Intel. But right now it's not meant to be stable, so there's probably some errors if you run in different. Uh, when it's stable, it's not going to have any errors, of course. But right now, yeah, it's uh, it's typical that you use something that works in one platform and then the other uses. Uh, also, Nvidia has their own validation layers uh, besides the Lunar G, so uh, usually it throws different errors. The Nvidia ones are usually like, nah, I don't care about that, so I just turn them off. Uh, but it's, it was the same with OpenGL. They just give you too much information, usually. They assume too much about what you're doing. But, uh, but yeah, the idea is that you can, anyway, turn it on and run it. And uh, we, We're going to have... Uh, uh, one of our contributors is setting up a, a farm that if you have, like, commits and PRs and everything, it's going to run uh, benchmarks and things, and it's going to, like... Capture if there is a regression in performance, a regression in quality, if there are validation layer errors that appear. Uh, so to avoid these kind of cases, we are doing, trying to use CI for these kind of things. Uh, we actually got a really nice donation from AMD to the GPUs and CPUs to make this, uh, this little farm. So it's going to be pretty cool once it's working. Yes? Uh, is there any key differences between WebGPU and Vulkan, or is it like WebGL? And WebGPU is more like metal because Apple proposed it. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's so funny because sorry, I, don't, I shouldn't say that, but but <laughs> they proposed WebGPU with WHLSL, and everybody was like, well, let, let's be in good terms with Apple. Like, uh, we could have done Vulkan for the web, but let, let's do WebGPU, you know, uh, because it's okay. Metal is easier to validate than, than Vulkan. Uh, and they went with Apple. And they told Apple, yeah, but we'd like to use Spear V, not really. And Apple was, well, let's discuss it. Like, four years later, <laughs> Apple is like, no way, not touching Spear V. So, yeah, that's what's happening. Sorry. No? Tomorrow is going to be the lecture about WebGPU. And really? I, I will be. You will, you're going to give more information? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you're, a, you're all witnesses to this. <laughs> don't, don't forget. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Uh, I hope, actually, I hope this is solved at some point because uh, it's really annoying. So to be honest, it's been WebGL sucks pretty much. Uh, it has too many problems. It's okay for simple things, but porting a game engine to WebGL. Uh, uh, has too many shortcomings, especially shader compilation is just a big, big pain. Uh, so I hope uh, if, if this situation is resolved at some point, that would be fantastic. I really hope uh, this, this gets solved. So I will assist your presentation. Any more questions or are we okay? Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.